Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, the listeners of the Creep Geeks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek for your free audiobook. Enjoy this with your free trial. 30 days of membership free, plus two free audiobooks that are yours forever. One credit a month after trial, good for any book, regardless of price. Exclusive member savings, get 30% off additional audiobooks, easy exchanges, go love a book, swap it for free, anytime, seriously. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook today. So it begins again. Welcome to Creek Beaks Podcast, episode number 203. Bring in the new year with UFOs, 2021 predictions, historic paranormal and UFO events, and more. Yeah. Hello. Hello. And welcome to the podcast. <laughs> I'm your host, Podcast Joe. <laughs> what? Okay, so anyway, welcome back to the Creek Beaks Podcast. If this is your very first time here, hello. Hi. And if it's not, then welcome back actually makes more sense to you. But anyway, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. This is our last official podcast of 2020. Okay. Yeah. I know right now somebody was like, oh, finally. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Okay, so anyway, we thought we'd kind of round out the new year with a whole bunch of stuff that we think to be interesting, because that's what we do. We talk about paranormal, weird news, all sorts of crazy things, and some of our experiences and adventures as adventurers. Okay. Yeah, we really haven't done a whole lot of adventuring, because, you know, we're not going to say 2020 and the pandemic and coronavirus, but yeah, it's kind of put a hurting on things, and amongst other things. In our last podcast episode, we talked about some of those things. Yeah, uh, a little bit, you know, in our Patreon exclusive podcast, which was uh, Creep Geeks Patron Podcast Number Eight, the Ocho. We <laughs> talked more about that kind of thing, but anyway, with this particular podcast, we're going to run out twenty twenty with some stuff. All right, and the stuff is UFO stuff, twenty twenty one predictions stuff, and historical paranormal type UFO events. Yeah, and more. <laughs> so go ahead and. Uh, well, I don't know. You don't really have to do anything. Just listen. That's all you got to do. Just strap it in. Now, if at any time during a podcast you find something that you want to talk about, you're like, what? I should tell those guys. We have a phone number for you to call. That phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Okay. Leave a voicemail because it's not we're, the phone's not going to ring while you're playing the podcast. And yeah. we're going to go, hello. It's not like that. But if you do have something you'd like to share and you'd like to leave a voicemail, you can certainly do that. We also have a website. It's called creepgeeks.com, and there's a contact form where you can leave other information if you'd like to do that. Or you can email us directly. That's going to be contact at creepgeeks.com. We are also all over social media, so you can hit us up on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, anywhere. We've we've got a presence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's do this. Let's talk about some news real quick as we move into uh, more exciting things. But we figure we should, since, you know, it's creep, geek, paranormal, and weird news, we should probably talk a little bit about some news. Mm -hmm. And the first is uh, Lou Elizondo announces that he's leaving the TTSA. Really? Yep. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know, uh, TTSA is through the Stars Academy, and base, or to the Stars. I keep saying through. Yeah. They should change their name because I can't seem to get it right. But <laughs> if you go to mysterywire.com, which is the website... It's pretty much, uh, I think it's pretty much George Knapp's website, or he's a big part of it. And George Knapp has all sorts of famous stuff associated with him. He is a news reporter, uh, news, <laughs> reporter, <laughs> news reporter out of uh, Las Vegas. Yeah. And he's done some things about Skinwalker Ranch. And most famously, though, he sat down and took the interview with Bob Lazar. Yeah. It blew the whole doors off of Area 51. Yeah, so he's got some credibility. He also does uh, hosting work on Coast to Coast AM radio. 
you know. So he's got his own little cred, but he does this mystery wire website with some other reporters, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, and it's pretty good. But it, the th- article is, is that Lou Elizondo is leaving a TTSA. TTSA, the organization, uh, you know, is has been making some waves here about, you know, exposing UFO footage from the Pentagon and all that. And it's got, um, what's his face, Tom DeLong from, used to be from Blink-182 as their front man. And they've been trying to bring the whole UFO thing out into the public and, and bring it some you know, some basically some eyes to it, so that this so, you know the, the whole thing was supposed to be about disclosure and things like credibility that, credibility and visibility. Yeah, yeah. So we we've had our misgivings in the past about Tom DeLong and some of the stuff that they've said and some of the you know air quote evidence that they brought forward and stuff like that. And there's been some stuff in the news lately, such as videos that have been shared through TTSA yeah. or by a figurehead of TCSA that may be less than genuine, whether yeah. it was knowing or unknowing, it still did not help, I guess, the mission statement or purpose of TTSA. Yeah. So these announcements from the interview George Knapp had with Louis, Louis Elizondo is kind of stunning. I mean, in, in my views, um, This article states there were several headlines to come out of the late night interview. And that's Elizondo indicated he, Chris Mellon, and Steve Justice will be departing to the Stars Academy, TTSA. And that in itself is pretty big news because that's three big figures leaving that, that group or that organization. Yeah. So why are all these larger people leaving the organization? I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't really say. Yeah, he did indicate that uh, he proposed, well, Elizondo proposed that there needs to be a creation of a larger, more permanent, well-funded UFO research program. So is that part of it? Are they running out of money? Yeah. I don't know. So that's what kind of makes it, you know, sort of kind of weird. There's been its its own sort of history involved with TTSA that over the years has not been probably as... uh, good for them as they wanted it because you know they've posted pictures and they've had issues where things have been proven to be um not authentic yeah and things like that and so george knapp asked a couple questions but one of the one he basically came to he said hey what's going on with the ttsa there's these rumors floating around an announcement is coming in january that's going to shake things up a bit he says what if anything can you say about it right yeah. so then lou uh, lou Alessandro says well i can't speak for ttsa You have to go through TTSA channels to ask them about TTSA. And I'll tell you from my perspective, I love my friends at TTSA. They're incredible human beings, but I also have to say my mission has always been very clear, George. And that's to push disclosure forward. That's it. I think after three years, you know, I can look back and say we've achieved much of that or much what much of what we've set out to do. Uh, TTSA is no secret, but also focus on focuses on the entertainment division. And as you know, let's face it, guys like Chris Mellon, Steve Justice, and myself, we're not entertainers. We're not. So very much like the History Channel project, we have accomplished our mission, mission, mission success. We've done more in three years collectively than anybody I think really expected us to achieve. And now it's time we shift from you know, you know, it's like a car, right? You know, when like when I speak in car talk, I'm kind of a gearhead, so I think a time has come uh, for the proverbial first gear to now second gear and we have enough momentum, enough inertia where we can shift gears, continue to move forward. Uh, and to do that, like guys like me are looking at a new and more exciting way. So basically what he's saying is it's time for them to move on. He thinks that they don't fit in because you know, Hey, they're not entertainers, which is weird because how many times this year have I commented that we've seen Luis Elizondo on TV? Primarily. Luis Elizondo is like on TV all the time. Yeah. So what is the shift? Because he did bring up entertainment, and I'm beginning to wonder if TTSA is becoming way more commercialized and more pop culture-ish versus what they um, said or thought it may be in the beginning, you know, to be more like, we're a legitimate organization, and we're going to investigate and and doing the hard stuff, right? Yeah. And now it's not. Now it's kind of like... Well, most of the summer, uh, you know, it was kind of... Sadly, in the news, how, you know, Tom DeLong kept seeing certain things. And it was almost like 
the notoriety or the press coverage was his experience seeing certain things. Yeah. So, like you were saying with the pop culture and the commercial, is it is it more focused on having more people seeing more things? And he wants to move to, let's get that evidence out there for whatever purpose, whatever agenda. I think it's become more cheese ball. Okay. And I think that basically Tom Long and everybody else who's there remaining yeah. wants more money. Hmm. They want more popularity. They want to be, they want more. They want this perceived stardom, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like we've hinted, hinted about this and talked about this in the past where you meet some, let's just call them paranormal, um, popular paranormal people. So you meet some PPPs. Personalities. And they're all about it. There you go. Personalities. Yeah. They're all about it. You know, they, they like to the, do the investigation. You can tell it's a labor of love. They take what they do very seriously. You know, and then you meet some PPPs that are like, you know, I'm doing this. I wrote a book. I'm going to be on TV. I want to be in movies. I want this. I want this. I want this. And it's like, well, what about Bigfoot? And what about this? And why aren't you? you Because they're they're more about their self um, growing themselves as a, as you know, getting that sort of that fame, right? Mm -hmm. Then the research is what they were supposed to be there for. It's like they wrote a book to be successful and they don't really care so much about the subject matter of the book that made them successful. Do you think that's what's happened here? Because like for me up until about 2018 ish, I always considered Elizondo to be more of that, that I'm here for the research. I'm here for the, the phenomenon. Yeah. I kind of think that's the case. I kind of think those guys are, it, were there for the research and the phenomenon and then the whole fame thing has started to happen. And now I think the idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, being a credible research type organization, right. Yeah. And it's sort of fallen by the wayside and more it's now sort of like, Hey, let's make movies and stuff. I mean, I understand he's, he, he says in here several times, I'm not an entertainer, but he cleans up well every time we see him on the history channel or travel channel, you know? I does mean, he though? I mean, come on. I mean, he does his best. But. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Though. I think maybe it's sort of shifted to the point now where he's uncomfortable with the limelight that they're trying to achieve, and they're going to do it by any means necessary. So he's tired of being dragged out whenever they need. Maybe, it. or they all got fired because they're not getting in line. You know, maybe they want those the History Channel documentaries and all the shows and stuff, and they want to get that money because hmm. they need that money to operate. I don't know. See, that's a, that's a because here's the deal. I mean, a lot of people, when you look at like some of the stuff that they took from Black Vault and all that stuff and claimed it, yeah, that they did it when really it came from Black Vault and Black Vault got no, you know, there was no like, you know, hey, let me give this up for my homies at the Black Vault for you know putting this information out there that we took and made famous. Yeah, none of that's there. Hmm. So I'm beginning to think that TTSA is not a real, I never or. What had started as being a real idea with real investigators and real, you know, sort of authenticity driven, credible researchers, investigators and all that stuff has now shifted to it's not anymore and they want to make a bunch of money. So those guys are leaving. But now it may be on the other side of that is, is that they realize that, hey, as an organization, we need to get this popularity because we got a little taste of it because of the Pentagon you know, tapes and clips and stuff like that. And we like it and we want that more money, but you guys don't want to do what we want to do. So you're fired. Mm. I don't know. Or the gravy train has come to an end and those guys that are leaving know this, they see it drying up and about to implode upon itself and they're stepping away before Tom DeLong and everybody else just blows the hell up. Or make some crazy announcement in January. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? And yeah. there's, I mean, there's also, you know, been the theory kicked around there that some of the people that they partner with are actually noted scam artists and that, that money and that they've been getting and um, allegedly using towards funding the research for TTSA and all the stuff that they're, you know, that they're trying to make happen with their mission statement yeah. has really just been funneling into people's pockets. Oh, gosh. You know? That's. I don't know, because if you think about it, it seems like some of what they do and how it affects certain people is almost like cultish behavior we talked about. And I kind of think that Tom DeLonge um, is as smart as he is. is not as smart as he is. Hmm. And I think he's probably easily swayed in this whole thing as to believe one way or the other. And I think if he's got somebody whispering in his ear the whole time, uh, chances are 
he's being whispered and told one thing when the public is seeing something else entirely. Like he has made posts where he's put evidence up there and immediately drawn it down and done all this stuff. And so, hmm. uh, I don't know. At, at the end of the day, I'm beginning to think that TTSA is disingenuous and that maybe the reason why Lou is leaving, maybe he sees it that way. Maybe he's part of it. I don't know, but there'll be a big announcement in January, according to this. And chances are, it's probably going to be silly. And I hate this because this is like trying to spill the paranormal tea, but there's not enough tea. Yeah. So it's a lot of speculating, which. Well, I mean, think about what he's saying. Yeah. Right. He's not saying anything. Yeah. And you say that when you either A, have been fired or B, you're leaving and you want to just try to be cool and not trash the company as you leave. True. So. Yeah. I don't know. The paranormal really should have like a gossip genre. (laughs) Oh, it does. And evidently we're part of it. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. So, I mean, it kind of is what it is. See, it's one of those things where when you, when you, when you see it and you hear it, I, I like, I'm like, oh, wow, that TTSA is just doesn't seem legit. I don't want to say that. Oh, I'm saying it because it just set off my radar. Like, it'd be like coming up to me trying to sell me on UFOs and all that stuff and say, look what we got here over here. Small investment. <laughs> you can be a part of this. You know, and I think that like in every car dealership, right, you've got the ones that will do anything in the world to sell you the vehicle. And you got the ones that try to be legit and be honest with the whole thing and are like, hey, you can't afford this car. Let's go over and look at cars you can't afford. You know, the okay. ones that have some kind of integrity to them where he falls and Mellon falls in this. I don't know. Hmm. So I just don't think they've earned my and it's funny because we've talked about this in the past. Earn my respect slash trust. Exactly. And, and like, and I think that we've given them almost 16 minutes, and that's too much for yeah, these guys. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so we're going to move on. TTSA, uh, look, three of the, I guess, most important people. I don't, I'm not really sure where they fit in the organization, aside from what we see on TV, appear to be going somewhere. Yeah. And it looks like TTSA is, uh, it looks like they're gone. Well, they're going to be gone. So anyway, hmm. it's enough of that. Yeah. A little rumor in your endo. <laughs> Uh, speaking of rumors and stuff like that, and this leads into conspiracies as well. Um, you ever hear of the Black Knight satellite? Yeah. And people are like, you know, there's been this thing orbiting the Earth. It's been there for millions of years. And they're like, well, no, it really hasn't been there for me. Okay, it's been there for like 15,000 years. Like, no, it really hasn't been there for 15,000 years. Anyway, and then it got to, well, you know, at the time of uh, Tesla, Tesla was, uh, there's this thing. Mm-hmm. It's a satellite, it's unidentified, and a satellite as in it rotates around the Earth, you know, just like if you dropped a beer can out of the space shuttle, it too would become a satellite as it kind of fell in the orbit and trajectory of whizzing around the Earth, right? Yeah. So the conspiracy has been that this thing is like this ancient satellite. Okay. Right? And it's been there for, we don't even know how long, and it's there, and we don't know if it's there observing us or if it's there to give us some information, you know, is it, art, what is it exactly? It's artificially made because of the shape and stuff like that. It's been there approximately 13,000 years old. Really? That's what they say. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, what is it? NASA says, hey, it's basically a piece of space junk from a lost mission, like a, a thermal blanket kind of a thing. You know, it does look like a Black Diamond brand thermal, like, down blanket that we have. Yeah, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's not anywhere close to being what it really is. I but know. Yeah. Um, and then there's all these, th- and like, oh, yeah, uh, Nikolai Tesla, he, you know, he he observed it, right? And he they call it the polar satellite because of the way it maintains its orbit, right? And it's like, oh, could it come from ancient aliens and all this stuff? And so in 1899, Nikola Tesla heard from aliens, <laughs> right? And this yeah. is that what Vice reported back in 2015. In 1899, Nikolai Tesla... Or Nikola, whatever you, however you want to say it. You know, either way, don't come at me, bro. <laughs> right? I have deep conviction that highly intelligent beings exist on Mars. Oh. And that's according to what Tesla told a reporter in Albany Telegram, 1923. I caught signals, which I interpreted as meaning one, two, three, four. I believe the Martians use numbers for communication because numbers are universal. <sighs> but sure, mathematics is a universal language, right? Sure. All right. So... At the time, there was an influential theory that Mars had canals that were made up by, you know, by these intelligent species, possibly Martians is what we'll call them. The importance of the canals for worldwide commerce at the time, without a doubt, 
influence the popular interest in the canals on Mars. Hmm. And so, um, you know, they're talking about the, okay. So anyway, to wrap this all up, cause we're not going to spend too much time on this. Yeah. The idea that this was an ancient alien satellite orbiting the earth, whether it was there to give us information to observe us or whatever is probably not true at all. Okay. Yeah. They called it the Black Knight because people in the key 1960s period of the conspiracy when it was first created were paranoid about the Cold War space race. Oh. And they were keen to identify that anything in the sky, right, Yeah, was basically like Cold War spy stuff. Because we're talking about a time where, you know, the Soviets and the United States and the whole Cold War thing and the nuclear proliferation and all that stuff was going down, right? And they're really getting worried about it. The Cuban Missile Crisis occurred. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, to come to find out in a weird sort of way, they spotted this something in the sky. They ruled out the small number of satellites at the time, decided it must be something else. And this is what NASA claims. And they claim the object was basically a broken off piece of the Discoverer satellite. Oh. Right. But as it turns out, people were skeptical, not only because the object was, uh, you know, not an alien spacecraft, but rather declassified documents revealed that it was, in fact, part of the United States Corona Project, a mission that produced the world's first successful space photo reconnaissance flights in an effort to monitor Soviet missile facilities. Oh. Yeah. wonder what. So basically... A spy satellite or a piece of a spy satellite. So the people that thought it was a spy satellite, but it was the Soviets, jokes on them. It looks like it was more than likely us. Right? Yeah. And then in 1998, the conspiracy received a fresh breath of air after astronauts noted an amorphous black object in space. And that's what they're saying. It's likely a thermal blanket. Uh, blanket. Or okay. blanket. <laughs> blanket. Yeah. I, I went over to the uh, Corona Project to see if I could figure out, since it's supposed to be uh, stereoscopic spy images. Yeah, we call it stereoscopic. Scopic, yeah, I can't, yeah. I was like, maybe they'll list what camera it was, or cameras, and I don't see it. Yeah. So. Oh, well. Space imagery. Yeah. But, yeah, it's like, I don't know. I feel like it's no longer a mystery or conspiracy. I feel yeah. this is a... Fairly it's, valid explanation. It's a piece of trash floating around in the in the yeah. <laughs> in, in space. So that it's no longer a thirteen thousand year old alien satellite. <laughs> it's just a piece of just trash <laughs> floating around there with all the other pieces of trash we have up in the atmosphere. We should we should just start a segment: UFO, ancient aliens or trash? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> aliens or garbage? What is it? That's a piece of garbage floating around. Oh, all right. <laughs> I seen this mist flying through the air. Trash. Oh, it's garbage. <laughs> Did it say Vaughn's on it or Lucky's or Piggly Wiggly? It was this weird thing whizzing through the well, air. Like, I remember seeing something like it was somebody had this really absurd theory and kept pushing it that the Black Knight was literally a Batman balloon that somehow made it that far up. And yeah. I was like, first off, no. Second, how? And yeah. They, they, they use their, they, yeah, I heard that too. It was like, <laughs> mm, no. So it's space junk, and it's more than likely from the Corona Project, and it's just a broken off piece of satellite where we actually put this new technology up and up in the space so we could see what the Soviets were up to. Yeah. Yep. I like this quote that kind of came in here. It says, um, there's no evidence that the Black Knight is anything other than the sum of parts that don't even belong together. It's like the old joke. All penguins are black and white, and old TVs are black and white, but all penguins aren't old TVs. <laughs> so there you go. And if you've ever seen it, if you're ever bored and you go on YouTube and do like Black Knight space satellite, you'll come up with all these crazy theories and stuff like, whoa. I do think we have a new goal, though. It's just trash. We have a new goal for those us. I mean, to get listed in a popular mechanics article, because so far they've listed two podcasts in this article. What? Yeah, they listed Mr. Don't say who it is. <laughs> we don't want our tens of listeners to leave us to go listen to them. <laughs> Dare you. Okay, then. So, Well, that's cool. So, Lou Elizondo and a bunch of geeks are leaving the TTSA, probably all moving on to fairer, better grounds or whatever. Maybe they're leaving the sinking ship like rats, or maybe they're taking the life preservers and going. Who knows? 
maybe they're taking their balls of knowledge and <laughs> leaving. <laughs> right. You know, like when you take your bat and your ball and you go home. That's why I was. That's the analogy I was going for, not the one that came out. But anyway, let's talk about real quick some 2020 UFO sightings as we move on through into the podcast. Okay. And um, I'm going to say this, as I've said about five times or six times this year in our podcast. If you see multiples of UFOs whizzing around, they're freaking drones. Period. They're government drones, man. And government drones, they've got like F-18s that can drop these drones. They've been testing them for a long time. So a lot of the, you know, the stuff that you see and you say, oh, what is that UFO? There's like 10 of them whizzing around or three that come together and make a triangle. It's, those are drones, man. And I, I would like to add, if you see multiple and they are very, very, very high up, it was probably Starlink. And drones. <laughs> okay, Starlink and drones. Yeah, because, I mean, with Starlink, you know, yeah, exactly. But it's like, oh, man, there's that, you know. Wait, there's 36 pages of this? Yeah. Oh, 36 my. pages we're of not, UFO. We're not going through hardly any of them because. My problem is on the first page, I see, like, one that's clearly Starlink. I see two. Actually, I see th- four that are drones. Yep. I see one that I'm like, huh, what is that? Yeah. But, and then I see one that's like. That dude, that's the reflection of your overhead lights inside your car. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there can't be this many actual, and I say actual as in unidentified flying objects that are like more, or let's just say, otherworldly. But, you know, than what we're currently seeing. I mean, you know, come on, man. We are also kind of contradicting ourselves because earlier this year we said, we did read or report on an article that said, because more people are stuck at home, more people are finally looking back up into the skies. Yes. So more people are looking to the skies to see something strange, whether it's a, a really good full moon or UFOs or some sort of space anomaly. More people are looking up. It's just those people haven't been through the paranormal and UFO for long enough to go, oh, that's Venus. Or, oh, yeah. that's a drone, you know? Yeah, and when I say drone, I'm not talking about, like, the drones you, you bought, like... For Christmas. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, the ones look like an, an X or a Plus, and they whiz around. I'm talking about these are, like, military drones. They've been doing drone technology for a long time. Yeah. Since they're military, they can do things like nuclear batteries and all that stuff. Since there's no pilot in them, they can fly as fast as hell and stop on a penny and do all these crazy things. You know, they can turn their lights on and turn them off. They can fly. They can... They can do all of this stuff that basically exhibit UFO-type behavior, you know? And there's even the theory that there's a bunch of things out there that have floated around the sky that remain silent and and quiet. They're there to do different things like, you know, possibly fuel things and and reconnaissance on things. They're called dirigibles, and I, I do believe that the government has gone back to testing airships, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, they have these things that, you know, that, like they've done tests before, not necessarily government, but just in general where, hey, let's fly this plane, you know, for 200 days straight using nothing but solar power. You know, I mean, so there's all these things up there, and they're testing these these uh, vehicles that get lofted into the sky and can stay there for extended periods of time, you know. And when you think about dirigibles and you start thinking about, like, the Hindenburg and things like that, the Goodyear blimp, there's other types out there, other styles, and it would not go so far or be so crazy as to think that they have these things out there that are sitting there doing their thing, whatever it is, Yeah, that can launch and retrieve drones or give it new tasking, new missions. They have planes that are out there now that are, you know, will have the Able Wingman, which is a drone that flies along. There's all this technology that's just becoming i think more public now and i think it's being seen and i wouldn't be surprised if before too long you start to see more than just the predator style drones that are out there okay like the little ones you know i think the little ones can do all sorts of crazy things and you know you have these racing drones that can fly every bit of like a you know over 100 miles per hour scale I guess. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised. I don't even know how fast they can go. And if you can like make that yourself with like 200 bucks worth of, you know, parts and some time, imagine what the full government can do. Yeah. You know, even, you know, maybe experiment with some alternative forms of propulsion because you don't have to worry about the whole biological factor of flight. You ain't going to worry about G forces and all that stuff. 
and LED lights have gone way beyond what we are used to seeing. You know, you have like different types of light emitting diodes. And all. I just think that a large chunk of what we're seeing is not UFOs. They're drones. Hmm. They're drones um, of an uncommon configuration, ones that we're not used to seeing. You know? Yeah. I'm actually trying to watch one of these, and I'm struggling because... Girl, you know we don't have no bandwidth. you got satellite. <laughs> no bandwidth for us. Well, what makes it even more fantastic is, you know, all the ads uh, load yeah. on here, and I'm like, these are some... These are some very inappropriate ads. And, you know, some of these cigar-shaped deals, they could be dirigibles easily. And, you know, you know what's the best way to make a cigar-shaped light in the sky go away? Uh, what? Turn it off. Hmm. Like, ooh, it's gone. Is it, though? Uh, and see, this one, the one I'm watching is the one that looks like, on this page, if you see one that kind of resembles the Phoenix Lights, it's the one that happened over Brazil on the 17th of December. Yeah. And you have to struggle for the first minute and a half with some very shaky, just outside the city limits footage. But then what it looks like is it honestly looks like a flare falling. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean. And then splitting up, which is kind of interesting. But it's. And then there's moments where it looks like Starlink. Because we've. Everybody this year has probably seen Starlink. Yeah. You know. But. I don't know why, and it's it's weird because they have um, what are the, those things, the spotlights. Someone in the city is trying to put a spotlight over this stuff wall, you know. Yeah, yeah. and it's not really helping the dude. Every time he tries to, it looks like his camera goes out of focus. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and that's part of it too. I mean, you got yeah. these things moving around, and that's part of the reason why I put the, the whole twenty twenty one stuff or twenty twenty UFO article in here and we have a link to everything we talk about on our podcast we have links to so that you can kind of go and check them out if you want you go to um our creep geek dot com and you can find them all there but i just think a lot of what we're seeing are not i don't want to say legit ufos but they're just they're just not it's just regular technology you know and it's it's getting to the point where if there's like 20 pages of this stuff I mean, come on. Yeah. I don't know. I just thought it was being interesting. As I went through and kind of looking at them, I'm like, okay, it looks like drones, drones, drones. That's possibly a dirigible floating arrow. Like, ooh, that one's interesting. I have no idea what that is, you know? And I think when you see, like, you know, the, the you know, like a jet chasing one of these things, maybe that jet's controlling that drone. Yeah. I oh. mean, the technology is there, and it, and it's not like it's, like, Secret technology, you got like Australia and England both buying drones that goes along the whole able wingman thing. And, you know, you know, if they're doing it, we've been doing it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But for me, there's one that's like two huge cigar shaped UFOs. And I'm like, those are the overhead lights inside <laughs> that person's car. Yeah. You know that. <laughs> Why is it's this? Like, what? <laughs> and, and, you know, it goes back to these shows that we watch on TV that are. It's all over the place on, like, Discovery Channel and Travel Channel and all that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it's just getting to the point where maybe this is the plan before disclosure, if it ever occurs, to make it so commonplace and make everything sort of fit these categories that when the real aliens show up, we're like, huh, and off we go. Yeah, but then kind of like with social media and, like, Instagram is a very good example, the oversaturation of a particular community or genre yeah, it dilutes it to where at the end of the day you don't care about it. And if you don't care about it, you won't fight it and you won't question it. But you also lose interest in it. Exactly. Like, and that's exactly what you want. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? I don't know. I do. I, I think that if, if you're out there and you're like, hmm, we want to be able to do this, it's particular. You know, it's like could be earth shattering, but we don't really want to cause a panic. Let's just make everybody not give a crap about it. Hmm. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's like... And let me give you a perfect example. If we were on a road trip in the 1950s and we seen huge bison, you think you'd get out and just go run up to it and take a picture? No. No. Hey, stay in the car. That's a wild animal. Now we got people trying to ride them, and they're shocked when these <laughs> things get all animal-like and flick them through the air and do all that stuff. Yeah. Because you see these Instagram pictures and social media pictures of these things, you know, being friendly and all that other stuff. And, you know, in the real world, they're probably not. As this lady got whipped through the air because she wanted to go try to ride the stupid thing. I mean, yeah, you it's an animal. Yeah. They tell you, hey, it's an animal. Don't touch it. 
And when you go up and touch it and it bites the shit out of you, people are like, I don't understand why it bit me. Because it's an animal. It's doing its job. Yeah. Its job is to be an animal and not be soft and cuddly. Just like I think Bigfoot is also uh, not hairy and the Henderson's friendly. I think it's pretty mean or can be. <laughs> So, yeah, anyway, there's a whole bunch of 2020 UFO sightings all over the place. And if you go to latestufosightings.net, mm. you can find a whole list of them. Mm. It's exciting, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, as we move into back into our podcast to talk about important stuff, let's talk about Nostradamus. I haven't heard Every his year, name. This they, year, though. I know, but when things get kind of crappy every year or so, somebody brings out Nostradamus predictions and tries to interpret it in a way to let you know that the world is going to end. Well, like, funny you say that. 2012, Nostradamus That's got exactly real That's exactly what I'm saying, yeah. And then 2016-ish, same thing. And there's always a so, bunch of, like, you know, pro, what do you call them, prognosticators out there. They're like, the world is all doom and gloom. Yeah. My favorite is the ones that go, yep. The world is going to end tomorrow at this time, and then it's like everybody's waiting, right? And then it doesn't happen, and they're like, what's up, dude? Wait, wasn't it last year? There was like three different yeah, groups. There's like, always a bunch of them, yeah. Like, and one oh, of them was like December 21st. It's oh, going to happen. wrong. It's just, it's the two days after yeah, Christmas. Like, well, and then like one year later. <laughs> you know. So I came across this article, and it was on uh, Mysterious Universe. And it was some uh, information gathered by Mr. Paul Seaburn, who we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast because he seems to be pretty interesting, or at least he's in the same vein of what we like to look at. Yeah. Um, and he basically talks about the zombie apocalypse and more Nostradamus predictions. And, of course, oh. anytime you say zombie apocalypse, <laughs> I'm going to check it out. You know what I mean? Because the hope says... Is that if there is a zombie apocalypse, they're like these like slow shuffling zombies, so I don't really have to run to get away from them. You just gotta like walk real quickly and you can get away. Yeah. But anyway, uh, there he, he does bring up some of these. Um, what do you call them? The quatrains. Quatrains. Yeah. Yeah. And puts them out there, and the, the whole thing kind of goes like this. All right to get to the crypts of it. Will twenty one? Uh, will twenty twenty one be better or worse than twenty twenty? Right, and we're. Going to basically do this in reference to Nostradamus and what he said. Yeah. And uh, basically, <laughs> let's, let's, let's just read one. All right. I'll read right. that one. <clears throat> Few young people, half dead to give a start. Dead through spite, he will cause the others to shine. And in an exalted place, some great evils to occur. Sad concepts will come to harm each one. Temporal dignified, the mass to succeed. Fathers and mothers dead of infinite sorrows. Women in mourning, the pestilent she-monster, the great one to be no more, all the world to end. Okay, let's break this down. Okay. Is I this... have no idea what the hell he's saying. Nobody does. You can interpret this garbage any way you want. That's either Nostradamus or every other Tumblr post right now. <laughs> I mean, this it's... Okay, and so it says that this one is interpreted to be predicting a virus released via a biological weapon that turns humans into zombies before killing us off. How? And if you believe people under pandemic shutdown sitting on couches for days streaming, this may have already started. Dead through spite, he will cause the others Few to young shine. people half dead to give a start. Now, I can interpret that as being youngsters today who don't give a crap. Right. Okay. And they're not living the world or in taking part in society because they're just being spiteful against the previous generation or whatever. Let's talk about like boomers and millennials, right? Yeah. And it says he will cause others to shine. It's like that's the problem with this. If it's interpreted one way, all it takes is for somebody to say, "This means, you know, this event is going to happen." And if that event actually happens, you can say, "Yes, I'm right." Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, you can say, well, I probably interpreted it incorrectly or it hasn't occurred yet. And that's the problem I have with all these. Because when, when I was a youngster, when I, when I was a young person half dead to give a start, <laughs> and I read these things, you know, and I read the interpretations of people for some of these prophecies, I was like freaking out. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah. And then so far, I think in my lifetime being 50 years old, I probably lived through a whole bunch of the worlds have or are, are, are ending. Yeah. You know? Like, one of them was like, oh, it's going to end around Haley's Comet. It didn't end for me. It ended for the people in the Heaven's Gate cult. Yeah, but I'm still waiting for, like, Edgar Casey predicting that 
the eastern seaboard was going to be underwater, you know? Yeah, but was that the past or the future? Because he could never really tell the times with some of that stuff. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. It's so. like this next one. The moon in the full of the night over the high mountain. The new sage with a lone brain sees it by his disciples invited to be immortal. Eyes to the south, hands and bosoms, bodies in the fire. This is as hard as when you're in English class trying to figure out how to write haikus. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I hated it then, too. It's like, was that 5775? Seven, seven, so, I, I hated it. I'm like, what? It's like. So, like, if you do have some college or advanced English education, you usually get taught how to break down, like, Victorian, Shakespearean, certain types of writings. Yeah. So, like, even if I were to try to compare this, like, Shakespeare, it this still is unintelligible to me. Yeah. Other than being really twisted poetry. Now, this is supposed to be interpreted to mean immortal mm. disciples is, is interpreted to mean robots. Either the fighting kind or the take your jobs away versions, because that's the only kind there are. Right? <laughs> uh, and neither of which is something to look forward to, just like the zombies that may already be here. Now, I will say, I don't know whether these are interpreted by uh, Mr. Seaburn or from um, yearlyhoroscope.org or wisehoroscope.org or the mirror or whatever. Yeah. But when I read these, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see how 2021 is supposed to be. I mean, you could read end, this whole but, thing to be talking about like a social media influencer if you wanted, yeah. you know? And so what I'm hoping is, is that, you know, these, whatever these predictions are, if they're bad, just don't happen. Okay. Yeah. Well, because, you know, they always do this and say, well, Nostradamus was said to have predicted World War II and all this other stuff and this and that and everything else. But I don't know, man. I think the vagaries that are put in here combined with your imagination, you can interpret us a great number of many of great number in many of ways. Oh, there's one about California. Uh, Does he say California? The sloping The land of fruit and nuts. <laughs> no. <laughs> the sloping park the sloping park great calamity through the lands of the west and Lombardy. The fire in the ship, plague and captivity, Mercury and Sagittarius saturn fading you know a lot of these sound like the order you hear yeah at the mcdonald's drive through when the speaker's bad <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. I, I don't know so i don't know um we we're going to go and talk about some of these amazing predictions for nostradamus but evidently you have to be able to interpret them not really going to do that <laughs> and you know yeah the new the newly made one will lead the army okay. almost cut off near the bank Help from the, what does it say? Help from the Malays, elite straining, the Duke deprived of his eyes in Milan in an iron cage. What in the world? Well, if you didn't know what this means, psh, this means the newly made one is interpreted to mean a chip in the brain soldier whose army saves us, but it needs to be prepared for more than zombies. So. Okay. Yeah, I think Paul's having fun with this. That's what I'm thinking. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, hey, as far as 2021 predictions go, I think the best prediction is to not actually make one other than it's either going to be overwhelmingly positive compared to last year or not. That's it. Yeah. That's really what it boils down to. And I think it's going to be way better for some people and not nearly as good for other people because I do think the one thing that's going to happen if things keep going the way they are is there are going to be a lot of people who are displaced because they can't pay rent and mortgages and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's what I do think is going to happen. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll, we'll kind of see what happens, but there you go. Okay. So if you'd like to read some of these Nostradamus predictions and interpret them for themselves, you can basically go to mysteriousuniverse.org. And if you can't find it, just basically look for Paul Seaburn, who we actually like. I don't want anybody to think I don't, I don't like the way he writes. I do. Cause I always look for his articles. I think they're interesting. Cool. So, yeah. I keep hearing weird stuff. Is that your computer? No. Okay. <laughs> I hope you didn't inadvertently open a portal. You know what I mean? <laughs> all right. So, moving all over the microphone here. Let's kind of get back into it again. Yeah. This is going to be groundbreaking news as soon as I can find a link for my notes. What? What? <laughs> That's my Nostradamus thing, right? Yeah. 
Okay, so let's talk about some of the stuff that you put in here from basically past. Like, okay, so last podcast you did some stuff like events that occurred in December. Historically, yeah. some more modern, closer to our current time period, and some further back. And you did the same thing with January. And and part of that is because I remember last January on the podcast we kind of talked about that that paranormal lull where not a lot of stuff happens after spooky season, you know, yeah. where there wasn't a lot of big news. And most of the big news that came out was oddly enough, UFO related. However, what we were struggling with was finding new things that were happening and keeping our listeners entertained. However, what I've noticed is if you just go and do some research, there's a lot in history that pertains to like, UFO culture and significant UFO history. Yeah. So the month of January is actually pretty lit up with all these different UFO It's events. lit, guys. <laughs> and a lot of it is from, like, the that UFO craze from, like, the late 40s into the 1950s. Um, we're definitely not going to go over these, but just in the podcast alone, I listed, like, six or seven events that all happened just in January. Yeah. And then... Uh, we were before we record. We were uh, before we were recording. We were just watching a special on the Ditlov Pass, and that happened in February. Yeah. So we do have that span of history, and as far as well, hit, you got to tell people what yeah. the Ditlov Pass is because you're probably pronouncing it wrong. I am. It. It's like D- Dilat- is Dilatov. It, I don't know. Dilatov. Dil- it's I like spelled Ditlov. like Dillentov. But basically, it's the event where campers, hikers, if you want to call them that, were in in Russia. Yeah. Like way out there, because I don't know exactly where, and they went up dead. I think it was nine of them went up like just completely destroyed somehow. And there's been lots of theories, and the main theory is is that Bigfoot, um, a Russian Bigfoot, they like in, the Minch, whatever you know, got them. Yeah, they died in the northern Ural Mountains between the first and second of February in 1959. Yeah, uh, I guess they were found like a week later. Yeah, and there's a lot of conspiracies involved with that, and there's actually a lot of shows on TV. And the, one of the coolest things about watching those shows is not the you know event that occurred and the, some of the hypotheses and stuff, is seeing Igor Bertsev talking about you know the Russian Bigfoots because he is the premier Russian Bigfoot expert. Yeah, he's been investigating Russian Bigfoots. Uh, or they call them like Russian Yeti, whatever you want to call them, basically, because I don't know the real distinction between a Russian Yeti, uh, you know, or a Yeti compared to a Bigfoot compared to whatever, um, which is probably making some Bigfoot guy really angry right yeah. now, you know. But anyway, you'll get over it. But <laughs> he is the foremost Russian dude. He's been doing it since the 70s, and we've met, talked to him, and hung out with him quite a bit in 2019. And the thing is that it never occurred for me to ask him about this event at all yeah and i don't know why but we did talk about some other stuff like when i told him i'd I'd been to to russia and visited that sort of thing spent a couple weeks there we talked about where i went and we talked about family and we talked about you know you want to get some things and send back um to his family and he talked you know and so it, it funny is is that we have conversations that have occurred like that where we should have been asking about these things that people probably want to know about but I always find it more interesting to find out about the person who is doing the things that everybody wants us to ask them about. <laughs> yeah. But Igor's the man. That dude, you know, he's serious business and he he doesn't make from the small bits of conversation we had and from what I've seen him talk about before, he doesn't make the Russian Yeti slash Bigfoot out to be a nice guy. Nice cuddly creature. No, he's like, you know, hear the whistles, they surround you, they eat soft flesh, all this crazy stuff, you know, which is the stuff that I kind of believe is going to happen because at the end of the day, I think he's still an animal, a territorial type animal, whether he's a human. I mean, I don't mean animal as in like a dog or a cat. I mean, like he's more probably more animalistic in nature. Mm -hmm. You don't see Bigfoot hanging out Starbucks, making an order kind of a thing. He's out there. He's got to do his own thing. And, you know, we are probably the bad guys straight up. We're the enemy. And I, I find it amusing that some of the events we've been to where Igor presents, I think there's been two of them where 
the person that was on before him was talking about leaving treats out for Bigfoot. And he's like, yeah, no, no, playing. no, don't do that. No, no. Yeah. He and tells <laughs> you straight up, don't do anything this person just said because and, you get killed to and death. developing a friendship over years with Bigfoot and playing knocking and would not games. And then Igor goes and just get, like you said, gets on stage. Don't do any of that. Yeah. You know? And, and it kind of makes sense because he investigated and was interviewed extensively about that incident, Diltoff Pass incident. Yeah. You know, and he's an expert, and he doesn't make them out to be super nice guys at all. And he's he's pretty, you know, he has a warning. Yeah. And I just think that's funny because, yeah, I have heard that too. Where like, And, you know, I mind communicated with them and all that stuff. He's like, no, <laughs> do not. These are animals, you know. But you now, know, if, And that makes the, that kind of goes to the question now. Are Russian Bigfoot, Yeti, whatever you want to call them, way more animalistic and mean? Because if you talk about the Bigfoot that – or Yetis or whatever they're called in Australia, they're mean too. Yeah. I can't remember what they're called though. It went right out of my head as I was going to say it. Oh, um, man. They're not known to be nice at all. And neither is Yeti. Yeti is not Yowie. known to be nice. Yeah, the Yowie. Yeah. They're mean, territorial, throw rocks, all of that stuff. So, And I think the ones in Japan are also like that, not nice. There's a lot of them that are just are not nice. The Vietnamese, um, what do they call them, rock apes, yeah. not nice, you know. Why is it that we're like, oh, yeah, they're nice guys? Maybe there's just different types of them. Oh, wow. And the Japanese one actually originated near Hiroshima. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So maybe the rock apes and skunk apes and the yaoi and the yetis are just not nice. Maybe they're way more animalistic than some of the ones that we have. Maybe we do have like a whole subspecies of Harry and the Henderson type nice, you know, old man of the woods kind of friendly, you or friendly, you friendly like cryptid type Bigfoot guys out there. Or maybe like the evolution of the canine. You've got wolf, coyote, dog. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> maybe they're in the middle somewhere. Yeah. So you got Russian Bigfoot, Yowie, American Bigfoot. Yeah. <laughs> but even still, because like skunk ape, a skunk ape is supposed to be the violent one. Or animalistic, I should say. More animalistic, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, there's a theory, too, that some of the skunk apes that people see and stuff like that are also confused as dogmen, and some of the dogmen that people have seen are also that sort of subspecies of, you know. Then there's also the theories that, you know, the Bigfoot uses coyotes and, and everything else, and there's, like, the crazy theory that Bigfoot somehow or another cultivated dogman into being, hmm. and they follow kind of along with each other. And I don't know. It's crazy, man. You can go through. There's a million different theories on these things, but I can tell you this. We don't have any definitive proof of any of them. Yeah. I mean, granted, you can have the aftermath, which is like footprints, but that really doesn't count. You know? True. But I like when they test hair and they go, yep, we don't know what it is. It's not human. <laughs> it's not ape. It's We don't know what it is. Yeah. And since we don't know what it is, we can't say it's Bigfoot. Hmm. So that's the problem you got, right? You get it tested to see if it's Bigfoot hair, and they come back and go, we don't know what it is. It's like, oh, is that Bigfoot? And like, nope, because we don't have a sample to test it against to see if it's Bigfoot or not. Uh-huh. So you're never going to win. Mm, just Unless you get a piece of Bigfoot. Well, or just keep testing it against known samples of other things that do exist. Well, sure. And they do that to determine it's not one of those known samples that they just okay. tested against. So remember that school teacher that um, was attacked in northern North Carolina and they tried to test the DNA found on her and it was like an animal attack. It was canine, but it, they didn't know what it was. Yeah. And my thing was, they just stopped at, like, neighborhood dogs. They didn't go and test against, well, they no, they did test against wolves known in that region. They tested with wolves, coyotes, mm-hmm. and dogs. Local dogs. And yeah. I'm sitting there like, well, did you really get every local dog? Did you try this? There's all these other Yeah, but there's certain, gen- gen- we call them genus markers that would let you know, okay, this is more domestic- domesticated canine versus wolf canine. Yeah. But they couldn't really say, and if it's a dog man, how much, how much do you, see, you don't know because yeah. you can't test the DNA. Is it, is a dog man like 70% dog, 30% human or what is it? You don't have that ratio. So if <laughs> yeah. you get this DNA evidence and you're like, well, it doesn't fit because we all, everything on this planet shares a certain amount of DNA. Yeah. You know, like they keep saying like, you know, Hey, 
there's only 2% DNA that separates you from a monkey. And I think that in your case, it's really just 1% DNA separates you from a monkey. And you're like, are you, are you insulting me, science guy? So. Or like with pigs, too. You ever hear that? Mm-hmm. Remember, love you little. <laughs> love you big. Okay. Love you like a little pig. Well, going from the Ditlov Pass, which happens in, happened in early February, going to January, there were several different UFO events. Um, and that just kind of ties in going back. Weird stuff actually happened in the past during these later winter months. Yeah. So going into 2021, we do have some historical stuff that we can look at or take a deeper look at because it is that lull period. So why not look at some of these older headlines that were really interesting? Um, The ones that kind of stuck out to me were like January 8th, 1981, UFO leaves physical evidence. And that actually happened in the trans and province in France. And a French worker, he was working and a UFO landed on his field about 150 feet away. He later described the UFO as looking like two saucers on top of each other and being a bit over two meters in diameter. Um, and that's in 1981. He said the UFO landed only briefly and then took off. He said he could see some sort of devices under the UFO extending several inches from the bottom. Uh, police examined the scene, took samples. A remarkable thing about this incident was the rare physical evidence left behind. There were burn marks on the ground and compacting of the soil, which were verified by a local agency, and there were trace elements not expected to be found there. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then there's something called the Mantell UFO incident, which was January 7th, 1948. Yeah, this one's pretty popular. Yeah, but then the more I look at this one, there's still all these different sources saying this whole thing was a hoax. And I'm like, what I'm reading doesn't read like a hoax, you know, because this is a 25 year old captain, Thomas F. Mantell, a Kentucky air national guard pilot died in the crash of his P 51 Mustang fighter after being sent in pursuit of an unidentified flying object. The event was among the most publicized early UFO incidents. Now, later investigation by the United States Air Force's Project Blue Book indicated that Mantell may have died chasing a skyhook balloon, which in 1948 was a top-secret project that Mantell would not have known about. Mantell pursued the object into a steep climb and disregarded suggestions to level his altitude. At high altitude, he blacked out from lack of oxygen his plane went into a downward spiral and crashed. So, that... You know, this one... Okay. Yeah. I kind of have a little bit of a, a heartburn with the whole idea that he, he kept trying to chase it and chase it to the point where his, his aircraft um, continued, but he couldn't because he passed out. Mm-hmm. He's a World War, II, World War II veteran. Yeah. And chances are, if he was a pilot and he flew in World War II, he knows the extent of what he can do. He knows how to push his limits. Yeah. Too. And they were saying, you know, okay, so what made this, aside from him actually dying from this thing, trying to chase it out, is a huge round white object about as big as a football field. That's pretty huge. Yeah. Yeah. And it was witnessed by a bunch of people, right? So we're talking about military pilots and military personnel on the ground, they witnessed it. Uh, highway patrol personnel, and ultimately it resulted in the loss of the fighter plane and its pilot, and the encounter changed the public perception of UFO reports. Yeah. And now this went from being more like, you know, like a shady source, you know. Yeah. To this guy's a trained pilot. He's a veteran. He flew in World War II. A ton of, let's just say, um, Credible people seen it because you have when you have jobs like in the highway patrol and you're in the military and all that stuff, you can't just be crazy. Combat experience, 2,167 hours of fly time. That's a lot. He had significant fly time. And when other people are describing this very white, about one-fourth the size of the full moon object that appeared to have a red border at the bottom, and then, you know, it stayed stationary for a little bit and then took off. Um, yeah, balloons are, they, they kind of like to keep on going. And and 
It's a balloon. So when I think a balloon, I think something that kind of saunters, like, like moves slowly. Well, even if they, okay, even with the racing balloons, because yeah. like we had like a balloon fiesta and, and we were in New Mexico and all that stuff, they can fly pretty fast, even if they get hung up in the Gulf Stream, but they can't fly. I don't think they can fly as fast as, you know, this P 51 Mustang. Yeah. I like, don't. I don't think this balloon can go like 200 miles an hour. You know what I mean? I don't think that's in the cards. And I'm trying to look at this thing that the Skyhook balloon, which looks disgusting. (laughs) It looks like if you were to blow bubble gum the second before it pops, this, that looks nothing like what these witnesses are describing. Yeah. You know? So I'm not buying the Skyhook explanation. And if you go online and search about the Mantell UFO incident, you'll find much the same information we've talked about. We put links in the show notes. But then there's a lot of places that kind of just debunk it. Yeah, but also, I mean, okay, so let's let's look at the comments for some of this. Yeah. And this is a comment from like two years ago. I feel like this this is a pretty credible story, as it would make sense if the pilot passed out and lost control from the high altitude. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's plausible. But the second part of their comment says, I just don't understand why he was so inclined to follow it, having the flying experience that he did. Yeah. You know? And, like, this guy says, I do believe he was shot down. But to say it was a UFO is a bit incorrect. Huh. You know? And we never really know. I mean, what if he got shot down chasing this object or whatever he couldn't necessarily identify? Because maybe it wasn't. You know, a United States military type object or a UFO. Maybe it was Russian. Maybe it was a spy thing. Maybe, who? Maybe it was us. I mean, who knows exactly what this thing was? But the description of what other people seen, and the description of what he basically, what he seen, doesn't make sense to be a balloon. Yeah, I guess. And I then, mean, oh, it's a bright balloon, and he followed it. He, he flew so high in the sky, he passed it. I don't, I don't, I don't get it, man. Yeah. I think that. At the end of the day, if this thing is rapidly uh, basically getting away or going away as it was, you're going to get to the point where you're eventually going to turn around. <clears throat> exactly. Why and would you chase it so far? You know what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. That, that's one of the comments in here. I believe that Mantel passed out due to lack of oxygen and crashed. However, since he was such an experienced pilot, I feel like he would have known when to retreat back to safety or, you know, slow down. Yeah. So maybe it was an attack on him of some right. sort. Because you can't keep fighting the fight and you can't keep persecuting your target if you're yeah. not there to do it. So he would have regrouped, right, yeah. to come back around to to protect the asset and then persecute the target instead of being like, I'll just take this thing until, you know, it almost reminds me of, remember the movie uh, Independence Day mm-hmm. where Randy Quaid Flew straight up the UFO. I yeah. mean, he knew he was going towards his end, but I mean, yeah. I, I don't, I just don't think so. I, I don't know. I think whatever it was probably shot him down or took him down. Or what if this thing was basically, what if it was a UFO? Yeah. And it decided it was going to get out of there and it disrupted all the electromagnetic field, basically creates like a little EMP pulse before it zips off into space like these things have been reported to do. And it conked out all of his instruments. Hmm. Huh. I don't know. You know, it could yeah. be a byproduct of maybe some kind of nuclear propulsion or something. Who knows, man? Now, some of the other events that happened, the Trinidad Uni- uh, Island UFO incident, that was January 16th, 1958. Project Blue Book uh, reported this incident as a hoax and that the photos had been manipulated. Allegedly, one of the people involved in this admitted it was a hoax in 2010. The thing that kind of bothers me is... This pertained to people aboard the Brazilian ship Almirante Saldaha, and everybody on the ship at the time reported seeing the same strange object. Hmm. And, you know, the crew claimed they captured several photographs. All those photographs were turned in, but in the end, this was claimed an alleged hoax. It's funny because this is one of the more clear photographs from the 1950s, and it seems genuine. Then the one that kind of i i don't know i feel like i want to do more research on this one is the berwin mountain ufo incident because i had never heard of this one before and that's january 23rd 1974 in the berwin mountains in the landrio Merthyshire, wales 
This one is interesting because it's got that culmination of high strangeness that we've heard before with weird events. And this is lights and noises were observed that were alleged to be related to a UFO sighting on the Kandar Berwin and Kandar Bronwyn. Scientific evidence indicated that the event was generated by an earthquake combined with sightings of a bright meteor widely observed over Wales and northern England at the time. So residents of Berwyn Mountains reported a very loud noise and a bright light in the sky. Um, UFOlogi- UFOlogists claimed a UFO crashed and the British government covered up the military's recovery of a crashed spa- spaceship. Some tabloid newspapers labeled it the Ross Welsh incident. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, Maybe so, it was a spy craft. Yeah. But the thing that I like here is like lights in the sky, meteors, um, enough activity to generate an earthquake or was the earthquake the cause of it. Uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Chestnut Ridge type th- stuff going on. Yeah. So I don't know enough about this one, but enough people reported the unusual lights that they were calling in to like the local press and to, you know, authorities at the time. So, and what are the, and yeah. And here's like the classified military defense documents also suggest the incident was caused by the combined effects of an earthquake and a meteor. Mm. Okay. I would think that's kind of probably rare. Yeah. Unless you're Nostradamus. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Kind of nutty. Yeah. So that's, that, and that's just some of it. I mean, I started to go down the UFO rabbit hole of January, and what I noticed was January, or um, not January, but like the, the late, winter months. Yeah, the winter months, especially during the first UFO wave, were really, really popular. Or things started in the winter months and came to a peak later on that summer, like in like like Roswell as an example. Yeah, you know. So, like, sightings had started in January or, or March, and then the actual incident occurs later in the summer. Well, maybe it's just UFO season. That's okay. what happens. Hmm. I don't know. Let's run it out or finish it off with this, the Stonehenge incident. Okay. And the Stonehenge incident happened, I don't know, 1967 or something like that? Hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is this a Stonehenge incident? Uh, the North Hudson Park UFO sightings? I don't know. It happened in 1975. This is an interesting story. Uh, according to George Obarski, while driving, he heard static over his radio and saw in North Hudson Park a round space, a spacecraft, right, with brightly lit windows hovering over the ground. And then 10 small, hooded, identically dressed figures emerged from the UFO dug up some soil, collected it in bags before returning to the craft. And then Obarski returned to the site the next day and he found the holes. Oh. And then he told this UFO, uh, told the story to a ufologist, Bud Hopkins, right? Oh. Who with other ufologists or (laughs) ufologists, how do you say that? Ufologists. Uh, Allegedly found independent witnesses, you know, like as in the doorman at the Stonehenge. Yeah. Which is the apartment building, right? Mm-hmm. And they also reported the UFO as well. And the incident was reported by Hopkins in the Village Voice and his 1988 book, Missing Time. And allegedly it was also in the local newspapers. So aliens pulled up next to this high-rise apartment complex. Yep. Went down, hit the Put park. their hoodies on. Mm-hmm. Went outside, dug up a little soil, and then got back in their little craft and went Took home. off. It sounds awful like a field trip. I know, right? And and it's like this now this this high rise looks very prominent compared to everything else in the skyline. I don't even see anything else in the skyline. So maybe it just got their attention, like, oh that's a great place to stop and get soil samples. Yeah, but it's New Jersey. Why would you stop in New Jersey and get it soil samples? It is the garden state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> North Bergen. New Jersey. So that, that makes sense. It's a garden state, it's a great place to get soil samples. I like how they say the building was constructed in 1967 during a high-rise building spree. Hmm. And it is the tallest building in the area, or one of them. 34 stories. It's a building spree. Yeah, 34-story building, 356 apartments, and five levels of indoor parking. 
That's nice. Yeah. Is it still there, I wonder? I don't know. I don't know. That's a great question. But yeah, it's pretty unusual. And see, it kind of runs the gamut. UFO stories, man, are kind of crazy. And that's the thing. You, know, you have certain contributing factors with each story that you use to sort of maybe use as criteria for other events and things to get reported, right? And then you have stuff like this. You know, yeah, this thing landed next to a, a skyscraper, right? A high-rise building, you know. <laughs> Like 12 of these people get out all wearing the same thing, grab bags of dirt, and take off. That's kind What do you do with that? You just put that in the outlier category? I don't know. I mean, they were all wearing little hoodies. Or hooded, I should say. Little hoodie know? outfits. Yeah. Like, okay, guys, get your dirt. We got to go. And then, you know, there you go. <laughs> kind of weird. <laughs> One little alien trailing in the back. You said we'd go to McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know. Kind of weird. Anyway, that's just strange. Yeah. And we do have links to all these in the show notes. for. The I can podcast. just see people making fun of uh, uh, Barsky. <laughs> What'd you see there, man? What? How many How many little guys was it? And he went back and seen the holes. Yeah. I don't know. Poor guy. Yep. See, I'm willing to believe that one. Yeah, it seems legit. Yeah. So. Eh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. It's Jersey. Yeah. Now, um, yeah, uh, all the links for everything we've talked about, they'll be in the show notes for this podcast episode. If you have any feedback or any other strange January related events, whether it's UFO or paranormal, let's like historic, let us know. Cause I, I'd, I'd like to look up more things and starting in 2021, we're going to do a little bit more about some of these more interesting Strange events. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's going to be contact at creepgeeks.com. Just send us an email. Yeah. Very nice. And just so you know, this Patreon supported episode is supported by our patrons. Doesn't sound weird. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so we have a Patreon that you can go and you can get some of the content we don't put out there for everybody, just for the general public. You could be part of that. You can support us on our Patreon. Mm-hmm. And this episode... It's supported by Dave, Isis, James, Bobby, John, and John, and Adam. Yep. Now, if you'd so. like to support us on Patreon, you can visit patreon.com forward slash creepgeeks. Other ways to get in touch with us or get to know us, join our Facebook group. We are trying to make that group grow. We have a Facebook page that's easy to find. It's going to be Creep Geeks Podcast. The group, Creep Geeks Facebook group. We made it real easy for y'all. Join, share some funny stuff, share show ideas. If you have a question, go ahead and share that too. We're trying to make that group grow and get more interactive. So, you know, drop on by. Yeah. Yeah. But it is the end of 2020 and this is where we're going to leave it until next time. Yeah. So I was going to say see you next year, but it always sounds so cheesy. (laughs) But yeah, that's about it. So anyway, we hope that the end of your year is not eventful and that we can roll into 2021 and have a, a more fruitful, peaceful, successful year. Yeah. So, but I don't want to say that too loud in case <laughs> 2020 you know, is listening. Yeah. In case it's like, you know, zombie and apocalypse and thing. robots. Yeah. <laughs> it's not over yet, but yeah, I don't know. We fully intend to be here. So we got lots of stuff to do. Lots of things to, uh, talk about some changes we're going to make and all that good stuff so we hope you stick with us yeah so yeah including bring out our uh our new coffee blend Ooh. well it's actually coffee but i mean it's uh, roasted to perfection i'm gonna call it mothman oh okay yeah. so okay anyway see you later take it easy see you next year Bye-bye. bye bye bye